One way, a ballad of peach blossom spring. The fisherman paddled up the stream. He loved spring in the mountains. Peach blossoms along the bank, clustered by the ancient ford. Watching the scarlet trees, he lost track of the miles, till the stream seemed to end in a place where no one lived. He passed through a narrow gap in the mountains, a dark and twisted way. Then the mountains opened out onto a broad, flat plain. Far off, he glimpsed something hidden among the clouds and trees. Coming closer, he saw a thousand homes amid flowers and bamboo. The first he met, he gave his own name in the language of the Han. But all the village folk were still clothed in the style of the Chin. Dwelling together here by their magical spring, they had created a world of their own. At night, the moon shone down through pines on their quiet homes. When the sun rose through the clouds, chickens crowed and dogs barked. Excited by a visitor from beyond their world, they gathered around him, hoping to bring him into their houses to inquire about their former home. At first light, every lane and alley was swept clean of even fallen flowers. At dusk, woodcutters and fishermen floated home on the stream. In the beginning, in flight from chaos, they had left the world of other men. Later, they lived on like the immortals, never returning. In their hidden valley, they forgot the world they had left. Looking in, all one saw were distant hills wreathed in clouds. Not suspecting how rare it was to find such a place, worldly cares turned the thoughts of his heart homeward. So he left the gorge, little marking the hills and rivers he passed. Then one day he left his family to make the long trip back once more, saying to himself that his old route could not be confused. How could he know that those peaks and valleys had changed since then? From the earlier time, all he remembered was going into dark mountains, down a green creek that twisted and turned to a cloudy forest. Spring is here, and peach blossoms float everywhere on the river. He never found the magical stream. How could he find the village again? So here we have the last of uh, Wang Wei's uh, heptasyllabic ballads included in this anthology. And uh, as we mentioned earlier, most of these Jui uh, Fu were written by Wang Wei when he was young and uh, on set topics. Now this one, A Ballad of Peach Blossom Spring, is a very interesting one because it connects with a prose text, not a poetry text. It connects with a traditional uh, uh, pseudo-history that had been written by a poem we've already had occasion to talk about, Tao Qian or Tao Zhuangming. Now Tao Qian lived uh, at the end of the Eastern Jin Dynasty, so at the end of the 4th century, 300 and something, 380, 390. And he wrote a fictional story, which we have uh, seen again now in verse here, about an old fisherman who finds, following a current, uh, uh, an orchard full of, uh, full of peach blossoms, uh, whose petals, whose red petals have fallen on the river. He is entranced by this beautiful sight and keeps going on till the source of the river. And there he encounters uh, like a mountain with a little gap. He crawls in and he arrives to a sort of natural refuge. Uh, so he discovers that, that the, the valley he arrives at has been completely disconnected from Chinese civilization since the turmoils at the end of the Qin Dynasty, at the beginning of the imperial period. Uh, so approximately uh, 200 uh, BC, the, the people, the ancestors of the people living in this, in this secluded place would have entered here. 
And after that, and until Tao Qian's own time, they had presumably had no contact with civilization, and they led a placid, happy, almost utopian life. So this is the utopia of the pure, peaceful, prosperous rural community, where people enjoy their lives, where they don't have to pay taxes, where agricultural produce is sufficient, and so on. So this was a topic that became very dear uh, later on in, in, to many poets and many writers, especially the ones of a Taoistic inclination, because, you know, this peasant utopia away from the world of the empire well, looked like a quite nice place to be or to go to, especially in times of political turmoil, invasion or warfare in the empire. So uh, Wang Wei does his take on this topic here. It's quite, uh, it's quite uh, unchanged from the original in most aspects. Uh, the topics of this poem, uh, and therefore of the text which it's imp inspired on, well, uh, the idealized rural community, rural life, especially the secluded rural life, as a utopia of peacefulness, prosperity, and simplicity, so that, that, that's where the, a lot of the Taoistic overtones in the original work lie in, in the fact that these people lead a life of simplicity without the need to know about things of the outer world. They, they're just happy in their own rural utopia. So the delights of the retired world, in this case the retired world is literally a world that is retired, that is uh, secluded, separated from, uh, from, from, from the rest of China and from the abuses that power uh, might engender. Uh, you could give a symbolic aspect to this place. It's, it's almost a godly realm. And this fact is emphasized uh, in this version, uh, as opposed to the original version. We'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, but anyway, even in the original, uh, this place is, 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 it can be interpreted symbolically. It's a, a space, a rural space, where one renounces the ambitions and the dangers of the world and where one can live a life of ease, the life that assures happiness for people, which is not the life of a scholar official. It's the, rather the life in Tao Qian's uh, theory and practice of the gentleman scholar who enjoys books and wine and the company of his neighbors and the works and days of agriculture. Now, I was saying there is a difference or so, there are some differences between the story as narrated in this poem and the story in the original. The main difference is, f so first of all, in the original, uh, the protagonist, the fisherman who visits and discovers this uh, locus amoenus, the protagonist is a little bit more devious. So after he has arrived and been feasted by the people in the peach blossom spring uh, township, he uh, promises that they, uh, the, the people want to remain secluded and protected, and he promises that he won't tell anything to anybody when he returns, which is a lie. As soon as he returns, he, he contacts uh, the officials of the commandery, and they try to go back and find this peach blossom spring. They cannot do it. Luckily, at least for the people in this utopian landscape, the, the fisherman, even though he carefully made uh, in a mental image and, and it's stated in the text, he clearly tried to mark the way of getting there. He couldn't get back to that place again, and others who tried failed. Which, which puts the emphasis on that moral aspect of being able to reach this uh, marvelous place. In uh, the Ballad of Peach Blo Blossom Spring by Wang Wei, the fisherman is not so devious. He makes no promise of not revealing anything, but he really doesn't. And uh, ag again, he doesn't trace the, the, the path to get to peach blossom spring, perhaps in, na in his naivety he thinks it will be easy to go back and uh, when he tries to return, after he has solved his, his personal issues, he is not able to return. Another difference is that even though this is a piece of fantastic literature already in the original, uh, in the original it is clear that the people who live in that bucolic village are real men and women, you know, the descendants of the ones who first went there. I think that uh, Wang Wei's poem seems to imply, ever so slightly, that the people living in this utopia are immortals. So when he says, later they lived on like the immortals, never returning. So uh, I would have to check the original or other translations, uh, but I think the indication is that uh, that uh, they, they did not die, that they kept on living forever. 
So those are basically the, the main differences between the, the source, the original, and this version. So now, as usual, let's take uh, a look at the poem part by part. The poem is divided into one, two, three, four, five, six, seven stanzas. And, uh, you know, it's a pretty narrative poem, so um, I don't think you could make very simple or clear breaks based on the stanzas. You could say that the really big two parts of the poems are, or the three parts, are first the discovery of this uh, wonderful utopia, but before that, uh, the, the, the discovery, that is how the fisherman walks around and not intending to find this place, he finds it. Next, the, the main part, the bulk of the poem, is describing this wonderful place. And finally, the last part, the conclusion, the last stanzas, especially the last two stanzas, would basically describe what happened after the fisherman left this utopia and then when he tried to go back again. So let's take a look. The fisherman paddled up the stream. He loved spring in the mountains. Peach blossoms along the bank, clustered by the ancient ford. Watching the scarlet trees, he lost track of the miles, till the stream seemed to end in a place where no one lived. So the fisherman is doing his job. He's paddling up the river. And, but, but there is an element of seduction. He loves nature. He loves the spring. He becomes besotted, uh, entranced, as it were, by the beautiful peach blossoms on the water. So he keeps going on, 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 on. And from familiar creeks and familiar bends of the river, he reaches a place he had never been to before. The end of the stream, probably next to some rocky uh, mountains or hills. He passed through a narrow gap in the mountains, a dark and twisted way. Then the mountains opened out onto a broad, flat plain. Far off he glimpsed something hidden among the clouds and trees. Coming closer he saw a thousand homes amid flowers and bamboo. The first he met he gave his own name in the language of the Han. But all the village folk were still clothed in the style of the Chin. So the poet, uh, sorry, not the poet, the fisherman encounters a, a seeming gap in the mountains. He follows it out of curiosity. And what he discovers is an astounding world uh, within itself, completely locked and separated from all the other. It's a vast plain and it's inhabited as opposed to the impression that this place was, uh, especially before entering the, the tunnel, that this was a place that was uninhabited. But no, there are, he is saying, thousands of homes. A thousand homes, that's probably a bit too much, but, you know, there's a wide plain with a big population and people living there. He starts speaking with them and they speak Chinese. That's what he, why he says, you know, he gave his own name in the language of the Han, the language that's Chinese, but all the village folk were still clothed in the style of the Chin. So this, these weird people in this remote and secluded valley are wearing the clothes of the Qin dynasty, which at the time of, of, of the original story would have been at the very least 400, almost 500 years in the past. And with respect to, to, to one waste time, it would have been even more. It would have been almost a thousand years. Dwelling together here by their magical spring, they had created a world of their own. At night, the moon shone down through pines on their quiet homes. When the sun rose through the clouds, chickens crowed and dogs barked. So they live here. This is a secluded world that is um, completely autarkic and uh, closed in itself and happily closed in itself. Uh, one of the images that is used, that is the chickens crowing and the dogs barking, appears in the original and it's a uh, a stereotypical image that denotes rural prosperity. So this is a prosperous rural community with dogs barking, with uh, lots of chickens for the people that they can, so that they can have eggs and meat. So it's quite a, quite a nice place to be and with nice views at night, of course, surrounded by nature. Excited by a visitor from beyond their world, they gathered around him, hoping to bring him into their houses to inquire about their former home. At first light, every lane and alley was swept clean of even fallen flowers. At dusk, woodcutters and fishermen floated home on the stream. So the story continues. He has arrived. He is, you know, uh, everybody wants to talk with him. He is a guy that comes 
from, from, from the outer world and they haven't heard any news or information about it for a long time. One would imagine, and I think this is, this is implied in both the original text and this one, that they would be or they should be wary of the dangers of an outsider discovering their, their ideal paradise. But okay, they, they seem friendly enough. So they welcome him, they want to hear news about him. And, you know, it's emphasized that they are rural people. You know, it, they, there are woodcutters and fishermen among the people dwelling in this uh, rural utopia. And now they're going to explain what happened. In the beginning, in flight from chaos, they had left the world of other men. Later, they lived on like the immortals, never returning. In the hidden valley, they forgot the world they had left. Looking in, all one saw were distant hills wreathed in clouds. So, yeah, this is the background. We ran away during the Qin Dynasty. We founded this utopia. We've been here ever since and very happily. And uh, this is a wonderful place with all that we need to satisfy our, our material needs and with a beautiful natural background with those hills, distant hills wreathed in clouds marking the frontiers that separate our almost supernatural numinous world from the other world. So the fisherman could decide to stay in paradise, but no, he decides to go away. Not suspecting how rare it was to find such a place, worldly cares turned the thoughts of his heart homeward. So he left the gorge, little marking the hills and rivers he passed. Then one day he left his family to make the long trip once more, saying to himself that his old route could not be confused. How could he know that those peaks and valleys had changed since then. So the fisherman leaves, he has worldly preoccupations, he might have a family and friends whom he is worried about, so he rather recklessly abandons this wonderful utopia and uh, you know the, one gets the distinct impression I think even if one didn't read the ending of the story before that he's not going to come back, you know this is like a test if you were uh, he has been selected or, or by luck or by the gods. He has been given this opportunity of joining this wonderful life. It's a take it or leave it opportunity. He goes back home. Later on, when he decides to come back, it's not possible. Time changes. Places change. Uh, you can never return to the utopia. And you know, th this connects also with the return to youth or the return uh, to golden ages. You know, you can never return back. You know, those golden ages that you might treasure, uh, whether it is in a different time from now, in your own past, in your childhood, in the remote past, or physically in some secluded valley, they cannot be returned to. This is you know, one, one of the essential tropes in all of these fairy stories and tales about this sort of, you know, idealized golden world. And the last stanza concludes and confirms this. From the earlier time, all he remembered was going into dark mountains, down a green creek that twisted and turned to a cloudy forest. Spring is here, and peach blossoms float everywhere on the river. He never found the magical stream. How could he find the village again? So time is cyclical in many aspects. It's another spring. Um, peach blossoms are on the river. But the original Green Creek has been lost, and the village has also been lost forever. Some things are not cyclical, some things are linear, and there is no possible return to the village. Uh, very interesting, the, the original story, the adaptation by one way is, okay, it's acceptable. Uh, you know, I like the topic, I, I like the poem. It's not very original, bearing in mind that, you know, it's just an adaptation of this story by Tao Qian, although most of Chinese literature does not particularly value, value originality of, of topic or, or, or even of, of form or lexical or variety and so on. Uh, I, I want to finish with one note. So this uh, story reminded me incredibly, and I imagine it's no coincidence, a very good novel by a Cuban writer which is called uh, Alejo Carpentier. He has a novel that I, I, I heartily recommend to anybody who wants to, to read it, especially if they can read in Spanish, uh, which is called Los Pasos Perdidos. And it's a modernization, said also in, 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 the, in Brazil, in the Amazon, 
uh, with some other elements as well, but it's a, a type of a modern adaptation of this story. You know, I'm not going to talk much about it because I don't want to spoil the plot for any possible readers, but it's a very, very similar story to this one. In fact, I imagine that Carpentier must have read some translation of uh, Tao Qian's uh, Peach Blossom Spring, or, or perhaps of this poem by one way, and uh, he used it as a, probably as an inspiration, among others, because there are other elements in, in that story, uh, uh, distance into the jungle as distance into the past and as uh, chronological traveling in, in the time and not only on the spatial direction, the importance of art, the importance of music and other elements. But, uh, you know, that novel, is, in a way, an extension, a continuation of Tao Qian's uh, Peach Blossom Spring. Uh, here, the story was synthesized in a poem, although the original story is not much, much longer than this poem. In Alejo Carpentier's book, it's expanded.